This is a story about space science, about the launch of a satellite, something which has become too common for many to notice. But in many ways, it's an amazing story. Like all astronomy, it's a story which starts long ago. It starts somewhere toward the center of our galaxy, more than 10,000 years ago. At that time, we had begun our first communities, banding together to survive the unknown. Back then, an ancestor foraging upon a shore much like this one stopped to sense the wind, to watch the clouds, to ponder the sunlight upon the water. As well as he could, he tried to understand that which is yet he could not. On that day, somewhere toward the center of our galaxy, lost in the haze of millions upon millions of other stars, is one of the most exotic objects which exist, a neutron star. A neutron star is the cosmic cinder left after a massive star reaches the end of its evolution in a titanic supernova explosion. It's a bizarre object, an object which has the density of the atomic nucleus. How dense is that? Take this cliff behind me, a huge cube, hundreds of yards on a side, millions and millions of tons, and subjected to the same forces as those inside a supernova, crushing all space from between the neutrons and protons, the cloud of electrons whirling about the nuclei of each and every atom that makes up this mountain. And the result would still be an object, millions and millions of tons in mass, but now would be crushed to an object about the size of this pebble. Like a pebble on the cosmic scale, this neutron star is only about 10 miles across, yet it has more mass than our sun. Because of this, it harbors immense powers. On that day, long ago, it sent forth evidence of that power, evidence we are destined to find. But for now, our ancestors could only wonder. They looked up then, perhaps toward a part of the sky which we know is toward the center of our galaxy. And we know they wondered, because that is what has brought us to a time when we gaze from different shores, the shores of space. Now we not only gaze from this new shore, we set our craft upon that sea. This is a story of one of those craft, the Rossi X-ray Timing Explorer. It's a story of people and a quest, of trial and discovery. It's a story of a craft whose destiny is in the pulse of the universe. Our universe is a cacophony of energies. Every single process, event, and particle hums its own special part in this remarkable cosmic symphony. Things that we're used to in our everyday lives, like the light we see and the heat we feel, are but two effects of this endless continuum of energies. Most of these energies, like x-rays for example, are completely invisible to our senses. When we gaze, as our ancestors did, on the Milky Way, we see an immense splash of stars whose serenity has inspired generations. Imagine now that we could somehow see x-rays, let's say only the brightest x-ray sources in the sky. This might be what we see. Drawn from actual data, these X-ray sources show us the pulse of the universe as a variety of sources flicker and flash over a one-month period. At once, it is apparent that the universe is not serene at all, but is wildly dynamic. This X-ray pulse is produced in the most extreme environments in the cosmos and is caused by the ultimate arbiter of nature, gravity. According to Einstein's general theory, gravity is the curvature of space. This schematic space-time model shows how an object creates a curvature, or what science calls a well, in the space-time continuum. The more massive the object, the more profound the well, or greater the gravity. In fact, a black hole, the most massive of objects, makes a gravitational well which is, in effect, bottomless. Because X-rays are produced in these extreme environments, X-rays can give us a clear view of what's going on deep within the most profound of gravitational wells, those created by neutron stars and black holes. By observing X-rays, the Rossi Explorer would let us peer deeper into these gravitational wells than ever before. And why do we look there? These are certainly environments we can never visit, 
but because they're places where, among other fantastic things, mountains are crushed to the size of pebbles, these places give us a chance to observe and test some of the deepest secrets of matter. In effect, we can use nature's greatest laboratory as a super, super, super collider of cosmic proportions to look right to the edge of physics. To do this, the Rossi Explorer would, in a way, take the pulse of the universe. The secret to this is that it would not only observe a broad range of x-rays, but it would time them as well, recording their variations down to mere thousandths of a second. Like looking at the sea, it would not only tell us there are waves out there, but it would let us understand something about their heights and intervals, even something about where they've come from. This lets us peer at the physics of extreme cosmic events as they happen, allowing us to probe the deepest secrets of matter. The pulse of the universe and the secrets it holds would remain forever invisible to us if we could not set our craft into space, for it is only there that X-rays can be observed. Therefore, the Rossi Explorer would be sent aloft to comb the heavens with a new generation of detectors, the All-Sky Monitor, the High Energy X-ray Timing Experiment, and the Proportional Counter Array. Developed by universities and NASA centers across the country, these instruments would work together to open up vast new frontiers of physics by taking the pulse of the universe. There are really three sort of what I call really revolutionary aspects to XD that we can do. One is the fast timing below a millisecond. The other is having the broad energy range between 2 kilovolts and 200 kilovolts using HexD. And the third is having the rapid response to targets of opportunity using the Elsky monitor. And each of those three will, will really give us, give us new discoveries. We're opening up a tremendously greater amount of discovery space. For example, right now we can form x-ray colors only after watching for about a hundred seconds. With this mission we'll be able to form an x-ray color in one one thousandth of a second. So that's a hundred thousand times shorter time. And around these neutron stars and black holes things are happening extremely fast. They happen in a thousandth of a second or even a millionth of a second. And so these are things that we don't know anything about right now, observationally. We have some theoretical ideas, but now we're going to go out and get that data and find out what's really going on there. Essentially, XTE is, is our guide to go exploring. And we're going to be looking at neutron stars, uh, and just phenomenal to think about it, a, a star that has more mass than our sun, that's uh, you know, contained in, in an area about the size of La Jolla, spinning thousands of times a second. I mean, just to try and use your imagination to image something like that is difficult enough. And here we're about to launch a satellite that's going to take us there and, and to see what it's like to, to be on a neutron star. There is a kind of magic in the way these new instruments will gather x-rays. It almost seems an alchemist's bag of tricks. Special crystals, gases, thousands of hair-thin wires, shadows. But it is really only science. Our understanding of matter is a bit better than in the days of alchemy, and the instrument teams of the Rossi Explorer wield these simple components in ways the alchemist never dreamed. The High Energy X-ray Timing Experiment, or HEXT, provides the ability to sense high energy X-rays. To do this, it uses a crystal of a simple salt to glean the secrets an X-ray reveals in a feeble flash of light. The heart of the HexD is a HexD detector, and inside the detector is two crystals, sodium iodide and cesium iodide. This very thin eighth of an inch section represents the sodium iodide detector. This is where we detect the x-rays of which we're interested. The way this detector works is that an x-ray comes in and makes a flash of light. The way it makes a flash of light is that it knocks an electron out of one of the iodine atoms and that electron goes flying through the crystal, exciting other atoms in the crystal and giving off light. This is a very faint little flash of light. You couldn't see it with your eye, but we have special phototubes that can see this flash of light and turn it into a pulse of electricity. What we do is use a photomultiplier. 
The gold color you see here is the photocathode. It's a special chemical on the inside of the tube that when it's hit by light, it gives off electrons. The more light that hits it, the more electrons come off. These electrons are focused by an electric field down into the center where it will hit what's called the first dynode. And this is a very special piece of metal that when it's hit by an electron, it gives off two or three. And the special electric fields inside this tube then guide those three to another dynode, which then make nine, which, and they're guided to another dynode, which make 27, and it multiplies. So for every electron that is given off by the photocathode, we get something like a million electrons coming out the back end. And that tells us an X-ray came in and what its energy is. To complete the Rossi Explorer's broad sensitivity to X-rays, the largest and most sensitive detector, the proportional counterarray, uses an ingenious maze of wires and gas to sense X-rays at lower energies. The detector is mostly empty space, but it tells us about tens of thousands of X-rays each second. We have uh, five detectors in an array. Each one is a proportional counter. It's basically, you need a chamber w with gas in it, and you need an anode and a cathode, or many of them. An X-ray uh, ejects an electron out of an atom in the gas, and the voltages between anodes and cathode wires that are in this detector uh, cause the electron to accelerate and to bump into other atoms and make an avalanche of electrons. Those electrons are collected and make a voltage pulse which in magnitude is proportional to the energy of the original X-ray. So you can use it to measure the, the energy of the X-rays as well as the fact that you got an X-ray. In our case, we have four rows of uh, 20 anodes, wires that are about as thin as a hair, and then there are hundreds of cathode wires uh, so that each anode is in, uh, effectively in a little cell about a half inch by a half inch. Uh, and that makes kind of a uniform uh, electric field between the, the edge of the cell and the center of the cell uh, to collect the charge. To maintain a constant vigil on the ever-changing X-ray sky, the all-sky monitor uses an elegant adaptation of an ancient imaging device, standing as a sentry with an unceasing gaze. The all-sky monitor, if you've seen a picture of it, it has these three cameras, and the sort of the flared out part is the direction in which it is looking. And as with the other experiments in XTE, it is detecting X-rays from distant, from distant X-ray sources. And what the All-Sky Monitor does is to scan around the sky, and every one and a half hours it surveys 80% of the sky, thereby sampling the brightest X-ray sources in the sky, like the top brightest 75. Therefore, it can give us data where the time constants are from hours to months to years whereas the pointed experiments will typically give microseconds up to the length of the observation, which might be only hours or a day. So purpose number one for the ASM is the long-term variability. Purpose number two is it serves as the eyes and ears of the whole observatory. Because the PCA and HEX-T are looking here, the All-Sky Monitor, by virtue of its scanning, can find that a source flared up over here or changed its spectral state. If it's sufficiently interesting, commands can be sent to reorient the entire spacecraft so the large instruments feel the view point at the source we're interested this source. And that can be done within a few hours, and that's one of the unique features. It's like the pinhole camera. Many high school students know about the pinhole camera. You just put a single pinhole and you can tell by where the image is where the source in the sky is. In this case, at the front of those conical things, we have a bunch of wires of, which are randomly spaced in this direction, and they're a long set of wires, and these, the x-rays can't get through the wires. So the, they cast a shadow of this mask onto our detector, and our detector is sensitive to where that shadow is in this direction. 
so we get information as to where the source is in this direction. In other words, we obtain a line of position on the sky, which is a long line. And that, if the source was not known previously, we can tell something about where it is in the sky to maybe within five or 10 arc minutes. The other shadow camera, you'll notice if you see a picture is tilted, it gives a line which crosses that and the intersection gives you a very good position. It is December 1995, just days before the launch window. The Rossi Explorer, with its almost magical instruments, stands at the ready, perched on the efforts of a vast team committed to success. Everybody on the team carries a piece of the mission, and in their hopes can be seen a reflection of our culture's resolve to explore. This is the point where the people who've done the development can actually turn it over now to the scientists and they'll get to do what, they're, what they need to do, and they'll get, actually get the data. It's just mind-boggling at the, at the dedication of the, you know, the NASA people that uh, did all the wiring and assembly and integration of this observatory, and you feel like there's a sense of accomplishment there. But you also realize that you're just one small part of it, a big team. You, you just hope that they take care of everything, because seven years of, of your commitment and purpose is sitting on top of that rocket. <laughs> this launch for the X-ray Timing Explorer is a two-stage mission. Uh, we have the first stage, which uh, provides about 200,000 pounds of uh, thrust at liftoff. There's nine solid rocket motors attached to the first stage. Six of those solid rocket motors fire with the main engine at liftoff. That provides a total of about 705,000 pounds of liftoff. The payload weighs about 6,700 pounds, which uh, the max capacity for the Delta II in a low Earth orbit is around 11,000 pounds, so well under the, the max limits for the, the Delta II rocket. This is the 230th launch of the Delta rocket. There's a, over a 99% success rate with the Delta system. It is the most reliable, most operational booster system, in my opinion, the, in the uh, inventory at this time. On launch day, uh, there's probably about 600 people involved, all told, all around the Cape in support positions. There's 70 in the blockhouse for the launch, and then there's about 150 more that are spread out in support positions around the Cape. Uh, this rocket has uh, been in process. We put the, the rocket on stand on the 22nd of July. It's a pretty complex system, but we're pretty confident we're ready to go, and we're looking forward to a great launch. This job is the most awesome job in the world because every time we launch a rocket, we're setting a new milestone in the history of mankind. I mean, it's something that has never been done before. This particular mission, we're, we're sending out X-ray Timing Explorer to look at X-ray sources around the universe that have never been seen before with this amount of clarity. It's an explorer. That's what the mission's called, and that's what we're doing. We're exploring new frontiers. Uh, we expect it to answer a lot of questions, and I'm not one of the scientists, but uh, I just think it's an awesome thing that we're doing here. Answering these questions is an awesome enterprise, which goes beyond science. It involves the work and hopes of many, set in motion by those whose vision is to be carried aloft. These key scientists are carefully chosen for their capacity to see the universe clearly and the daring to look even farther. And now their greatest hopes and perhaps fears are soon to be realized. I built model airplanes as a kid and now, holy cow, here's a real NASA rocket with the real strap-ons on it and I'm going up in a real NASA tower, you know. And now, when I go in the white room, which is that sealed off room at the top, there's the spacecraft. This is the thing I've been working on for 15 years, you know. Now coming to this point where it's all in the balance, but sort of out of my hands, it, it, it's just thrilling. Now that we're really launching, the issue is will the whole thing get up there? It's a one-shot chance, and that's why I'm more than happy to wait. And you can make the list of what has to happen at t equals zero. I mean, it is amazing. I don't want them to rush into anything. They have to light off six of those nine solid boosters that surround the main rocket, and those are big things, 40 inches diameter. I don't know how tall. They must be like 12, 15, or 20 feet tall. They're like dynamite. I expect that it'll be a few terrifying minutes while I watch this explosion going on 100 feet below the, the satellite. <laughs> they go boom. You know, Once they light, you're gone. 
All six of those have to ignite simultaneously, a sort of a fuse-like device that sends f burning gunpowder literally through a tube that goes around and little T's come off to each of the six. They light that off and they all, the gunpowder goes and boom, lights them all off. They burn for 60 seconds while the main engines with the kerosene and oxygen are also burning. So many people have worked so hard on it that I hope it will be launched successfully and get good data. <laughs> When that 60 seconds is up, they light two more of these gunpowder things, which release the tops and the bottoms of these six big boosters. And that lets them get jettisoned, what they have to do. We don't want to carry the weight. There's a certain um, childish excitement about launching a, <laughs> launching a hundred foot high rocket <laughs> into Earth orbit. Then they do it again with the last three boosters. Every third one is so-called air lit. That's a long way from launching your little Estes rockets out on the ball field when you're a kid. <laughs> the first stage keeps burning. When that burns out, the second stage has to light. That's a very corrosive hydrazine, and I don't know what the other element is, which can be turned on and off. Well, I don't like to think that it would fail to get into orbit. But before it turns off, after four minutes, 280 seconds, the fairing gets tossed out, and all of a sudden, the front detector of the ASM becomes, I called it the nose cone. Somebody else said it's the bumper, <laughs> which is a little frightening to think about. It's leading the way. My biggest fear is that something will go wrong, and that the instrument, my instrument won't work the way I would like it to, or only half of the detectors will be able to be used, or something like that. And then the spacecraft goes through its crucial maneuvers of getting the solar panels out, which are fo three folded things up here, and the antennas out, so it can acquire both power and telemetry access. Then I might be afraid that we had overlooked something and that the instruments won't work as they're supposed to. When all that happens, and the thing is stabilized, and that's not till 78 minutes after launch, more or less, will we all rest easy. Those critical first steps to space have always started with a single button and a singular moment, T equals zero. Today they practice, but soon will come the instant where all that has been hoped for depends on a few furious seconds. This will be the first launch to start with the click of a mouse. The procedure is perfected, but to challenge gravity is a treacherous task, which carries a heavy burden. This is the uh, first stage control console, which controls the first stage of the rocket. T minus 10 seconds, I'll hit arm igniters, which will uh, arm all the igniters on the rocket. Uh, in the meantime, I'll be waiting for a test conductor to tell me that we have a green board, which means that everything's ready to go. And then at T minus 2.7 seconds, I'll hit engine start at which time the engine will start up and hopefully we'll get first motion. If we don't get uh, a good engine start, I'll get Miko Vico, which will be a main engine cutoff or any engine cutoff. And it's my job to tell them what's, uh, whether we had liftoff or not. The launch experience is not a peaceful event. It's just sort of a furious event of, of vibration and noise and sound and, and acceleration. And the truth is it's very, very hard to get something to orbit. It takes a lot of energy to get it off the planet. Even a small satellite, relatively small satellite like X-ray Timing Explorer, uh, takes a really huge rocket, a lot of energy. This is such a big part of my husband's life, the last 15 years, basically. This is really a part of him that's going up there. A part of my dreams for him are going up there, too. This is the big thing of my dad's life. It's going to be like... I don't know, watching like a four or five year old open a present. I'll just be hopeful. <sighs> I have butterflies in my stomach. December 10th, 1995. The three day launch window is about to open. The Rossi Explorer and the Delta vehicle go through the final preparations for launch. The huge gantry, which has been the rocket's earthly cradle, is removed as the vehicle is prepared to challenge gravity. After months of testing and practice to perfection, all is ready. T with countdown. T 
DM1. Ready. SSC. Ready. SSP. Ready. DM2. Ready. HYE. Ready. FMA. Ready. ATC3. Ready. ATC2. Ready. Vehicle Electronics. Ready. MEA. Ready. EEA. Ready. TEA. Ready. AE. Ready. Parents, children, spouses, and siblings of the mission teams have come to share in what is a pivotal event in the mission and their lives. Spirits alone are ready to lift the Rossi Explorer to orbit. It's finally happening. I pinch myself uh, every few minutes or so just you know, to make sure that I'm here and r realizing that it, it's really about to happen. It's been 15 years, but this is the beginning. In a sense, the launch is going to be like a big bang. It'll be uh, the start of, start of my universe for the, at least the next couple of years. How am I feeling? Other than a little cold, um, antsy. Come on, let's do this thing. Let's do it. Rick Rothschild, principal investigator of the Hex T, is joined by his entire family. The atmosphere is merry with anticipation. But in the course of time, nature will conduct a trying test of patience. This is Delta Launch Control at T-minus four minutes and holding, and the uh, winds that affect the uh, structural loads on the vehicle at uh, max Q are out of limits. Uh, this time we are uh, continuing our hold at T-minus four minutes. This is Delta Launch Control. We're special. We get to do it again tomorrow. Get all excited again. Get all revved up. I can take the one-day delay, or even two, if for some weirdo reason that happens. I woke up this morning realizing that I'm a little bit nervous about it. I want to see it go off and I want to see a nice trajectory. You know, I'm very confident this thing will work. I have no, I don't really have any, any fears at all of the, I mean, I probably should. But I'm cautiously excited about it, about it going off this morning. It looks like a good day weather-wise, though, so. If there's uh, any further delays, then we'll have to look at tomorrow. Now, tomorrow looks pretty good, but then we said the same thing yesterday. We'll halt the operation, call an official no go. Uh, I thought today was going to be it. I feel a little let down. It's a little crazy, it's a little frustrating, but this is the way it is. NASA has no control over the weather. They have no control over the high altitude winds. Mother Nature uh, likes to play with us. OSM. Ready. RCO. Ready. AETM. Ready. McDonald Douglas Chief Engineer. Ready. McDonald Douglas Launch Director. Ready. NASA spacecraft coordinator, report spacecraft is ready to continue with countdown. Spacecraft is ready. Copy. We're in good shape now. There are no technical issues being addressed on the vehicle at all. So we're, again, uh, pressing on for launch. On time at 9.39 a.m. Eastern Time from Complex 17A. Uh, we'll have a final weather update uh, in the next several moments, but again, it's all just noted that that will be green. On my mark, and one second stealth test. Three, two, one, zero. Three, two, one, zero. Three, two, one, zero. Three, two, one, zero. We do have some pretty solid indication that the winds aloft have just now dropped uh, uh, out of our limits, and uh, we are in a no-go situation uh, at this time. Uh, we do have another balloon that is uh, en route right now. Uh, that's drifting uh, to those upper altitudes. If you look up above that cloud, you can see a silver dot. That's the balloon. Okay, that's it. All right. Well, the hat didn't work, but you never know. I'm sure there was a good reason it wasn't supposed to go today. Too bad, but hey, yep. such is life. Yep, we'll see you guys.
9.41 a.m. Today, everything looks like we're going to go, and so I'm a lot more jittery than I was last week. <laughs> I didn't really believe it was going to launch on the last times because the winds were always so bad. It was like there was very little chance it was ever actually going to go up on those days. At this point, we are in a no go status due to the upper altitude uh, limits on wind, and we're standing Ground by for day. additional information to be coming forth in about 15 or 21 minutes. Uh, the balloon data has arrived, uh, and it, uh, it is looking like we are no go for the day. This is the uh, fourth uh, scrub that we've had on this Delta vehicle on the XTE uh, satellite. Oh, looks like that, so not what amazes me is. If we get the winds right, everybody here is going to say, oh, we're all set. You still need those 25 things to work right sequentially all the way up. I think it's easy to forget that. You know, when that when we hit zero, that's, that's still heartthrob time. <laughs> This is Delta Launch Control at T minus four minutes and holding. Our uh, weather data is good through about 10:15. Uh, uh, we are still green on all fronts as far as the uh, surface weather is concerned and as far as the upper altitude weather is concerned. That word just coming in from the range safety officer that uh, we cannot support a launch at uh, 9.51, so we're standing by for uh, the earliest possible opportunity. Uh, we're in the process of uh, discussing whether we should retard the launch for uh, 10.01. Gee, they had me going there for a second. <sighs> we are now going to target a launch for 10.01 a.m. Eastern Time. Still contingent on uh, good words coming in from Wing Safety that their systems are up and running. Come on, folks. They're actually under the four minute mark. <laughs> Word is now coming in that the uh, range safety officer has reported that they are ready to support launch. I'm getting enthusiastic again. There I go. You're assuming this thing. Various systems are again reporting in that they are ready to support launch. <laughs> and that we have a, a go to uh, support launch at 201 AM today. This is as close as we've got. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and we're at T minus four minutes and counting. The vents in the uh, blockhouse at Complex 17 are at this time being sealed to protect the launch team from the smoke and vapors of the Delta launch. All is continuing to run well in the countdown of the X-ray timing explorer, and weather is of no concern to us today as we look forward to a successful launch. T minus three minutes. Mark. Second stage helium and oxygen systems are confirmed to go for launch. We expect to hear shortly that the first stage oxygen vents will be closed. T minus two minutes. Mark, pressurizing. And final permission has been granted to launch from the flight director to the launch director. T minus 60 seconds and counting. Liquid oxygen tanking is reported at 100%. Everything continues to look good for launch today at 10.01 a.m. Eastern time coming up in 35 seconds. Electronics go. Hydraulics go. Minus 30. We have final clears to launch from all aspects of the system today. T minus 15. 12. 11. 10. 9. 8. 7. 6. 5. 4. 3. 2. 1. We have ignition and we have a main engine cutoff. Main engine cutoff. Going through safing procedures at this time. Verify engine valves closed. Valves closed. Mission managers again are de trying to determine exactly what the cause of this was. It appears to be something within the uh, LOX valve, although that is very preliminary. Uh, but the bottom line is that we will not be launching uh, Delta XTE today. Talk about emotionally draining. That one was worse than just oh we're going to scrub, you know, due to high altitude winds. But oh well. 
so it goes. I can remember what was going through my mind down there yesterday, and that was, where's the fire? There's supposed to be a bright light at the bottom of the rocket. Where's the fire? And about the time the second sentence of that had gone through my head, they're calling main engine shut down, and it made, it made sense then. My initial thoughts then were, don't let the solids light, because I knew if they had fired the solids, we'd be in the ocean right now and very unhappy. And so all of their safety procedures worked perfectly in that it didn't see the main engine at full thrust, so it didn't fire the solids. You know, that's exactly the way it's uh, supposed to work. And uh, yes, it's frustrating that uh, it didn't go, and let's find out why that valve didn't open and get it fixed. But you didn't put a $200 million satellite in the drink either. You know, it's there waiting to go when they do have it fixed. The hopeful Rossi teams have endured a long series of frustrations, and now the government shutdowns of late 1995 have reduced contact with the most pivotal event in their careers. The Hexty team gathers in San Diego. Reminiscent of bygone eras of discovery, they are forced to glean tidbits about the exploits of their explorer via telephone. Hi, it's Rick Rothschild. Oh, hey, Rick, how you doing? Pretty good. This is Tom Field. Hey, Tom. On status. Yeah, have they scrubbed for the day? I don't think they, no, they've not officially scrubbed, but it's looking pretty dismal. We're expecting a scrub. They, they just scrubbed. They just scrubbed for yeah. today. They just scrubbed for today. Okay. We'll try again tomorrow. Tomorrow looks like uh, the best weather day, and then Sunday looks bad again. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, thanks a lot. Sure thing. I'll, I'll be talking with you. Okay, doke. Right, take care. Bye. Bye bye. All right. All righty. So it goes. This is Delta Launch Control. The flight director has just completed a briefing to the NASA launch manager on the upper level wind profiles and. We're glad to have go conditions this morning for launch, and we are still optimistic we will meet the opening of the launch window at 8.48 this morning. T-minus 15 minutes. Mark. RCO, switch to master transmitter and report complete. Prop 1, verify engine regulator, go. Go. Verify booster helium and nitrogen pressures within limits prior to the end of the building hole. Roger. T-minus eight minutes, mark. Prop two, PSD purge, press open. Open. ATC three, verify FABU and engine heaters go. Go. Prop two, verify locks and vehicle purge closed. Closed. T-minus seven minutes, mark. This is Delta Launch Control. We're not looking at any problems either from the Delta or XTE parts of the mission. Made it just in time. We're ready for a launch on time. It's right at the opening of the window. T minus five minutes. Mark. Prop one, launch enable on. On. SSP, launch enable on. On. Timer at T minus four minutes, verify the sequencer is holding. We're standing by now to go into the 10 minute hold at T minus four minutes. Going into the hold in, in three, two, one, T minus four minutes and holding. There you go. This is and where we'll be we always stop now for before. a weather briefing. Looking at uh, upper level wind profiles right now, it's looking it's looking really good, and uh, we'll be green uh, through the uh, entire launch window. NASA quality. NASA quality is go. NASA safety. NASA safety is go. XTE mission director. The spacecraft is on internal power, and we're definitely ready for launch. Thank you. FSC, ready. Gosh, Prop I wish we had ready. the television. Prop 2, ready. TM1, ready. SSC, ready. SSP, ready. TM2, ready. HYE, ready. FMA, ready. ATC3, ready. ATC2, ready. And we've just received word that we are ready to pick up the countdown, and we're going through the final steps in the blockhouse for preparing to pick up the count. All personnel, stand by for release of the hold. And this has 
really been a flawless countdown this morning. Well, he just jinxed it. <laughs> Picking up in three, two, one, <clears throat> T minus four minutes and counting. T minus four minutes and counting. Holy cow. Personnel accomplished items two through five. Z prop two, establish and maintain locks topping at 100% level. Topping at 100%. And we are off and running toward an on time launch at 8.48 this morning. T minus three minutes. Mark. T minus three minutes and counting. Now being armed for the ignition sequence. Spacecraft is go. Coming up on T minus two minutes. Mark. And the McDonald Douglas launch director has just advised the flight director that we are clear to launch. HYE, check hydraulic pressure go. Hydraulic pressure go. T minus seventy seconds. RCO report range go for launch. Range is go. Hundred percent lock. Vehicles now topped off. LTDR, LT-70, they launch enable flight. Flight. Firing chain is armed. That guy is go. Hydraulics go. 20 minutes, 20 seconds. T-15. T-10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, Dot shifted dot tom two. Okay. Anyway, yeah. This is definitely a different New Year's Eve for me. When the data starts coming in on this screen, we will see the counting rate from the one detector. We'll start to see how many counts are coming in every four seconds. The Goddard Control Center will s manually send the commands. They go to White Sands, New Mexico. They go up to the Tedra satellite. They go down to XTE. The XTE spacecraft accepts the commands, which then uses its radio to send the data actually up to Tedris and down to White Sands and then back to the Goddard SOC. And, and at no time do their hands leave their wrists. Nothing up either sleeve. <laughs> Set high voltage commands went through successfully. <laughs> he, and he, executed. And These executed. are the first hexty commands. Heck, first hexty commands. And so now we should, in a little bit, start seeing uh, the fruits of the labor, so to speak. Ah, there we are. We have rates. Okay, and the rates We have are spectra 4,000. Look at that. There's a spectra. Can you believe yeah. it? But no, the, here, in the histogram. We have 170 counts. It's just a hair over 10 counts a second. All right. All right. Let's keep looking at this thing. We're getting about 1,000, 1,100 count, 1,100 arms a second. 
we're getting under, we're getting 900 triggers, and out of that, we are getting 200 in 16 seconds. 20. So we're, get, we're getting a little over 10 counts a second of good events in the detectors. Of 100 events that are made in one of our detectors, only one of those or thereabouts is an X-ray. All the others are due to charged particles, cosmic rays that are running around in outer space. So our instrument has to be smart enough to be able to discriminate between X-rays and these charged particles. What we're seeing on displaying on the screen in this window right here is the very, are the various rates we get from our detector. So by looking at these rates, we can get an idea of how many we're throwing away. That's this hardware veto down here. In this example, we threw out 10,034 out of 10,051 events that happened to have come in. We only had about 17 good events come out. Those 17 events, then, we can look at in one of two ways. This upper plot here just says, how many counts did we get each second? How many good events did we get each second in 16 seconds? And this is what we would use later on when looking at an x-ray source to see is it getting bright and dim and bright and dim. We can follow the intensity. The other thing we look at is the spectrum. How are these x-rays um, distributed in energy? Not in time, which we saw up here, but in energy. How many high energy ones did we have? How many low energy ones did we have? And that's this plot right down here. And what we can see is, boy, it looks like there were a bunch of, of of events around this energy, a bunch around this energy, and a bunch out here among this at this energy. This is what I've been waiting for, and it's starting to happen, and I love it. The Rossi Explorer has been in orbit less than three weeks, and it's already fulfilling its destiny. Three arc minutes. That's um, significantly better. Somewhere in our galaxy, a powerful new source well, has been located by another NASA amazing. observatory. The Rossi instrument okay. teams communicate across the country as they coordinate the observation. On. Like About once an hour, this new object becomes ten times brighter for a few seconds. It is bursting. Unlike all other astronomical observations, these astronomers are watching this astounding new object in real time. Yes. Oh God! It just bursted. Oh baby, come on! You need to stop. Oh, we got it! Woohoo! I guess you heard that. <laughs> oh yeah! So 25,000 events on each cluster. Well, we finally built the bigger and better instrument. This thing is like a, uh, a Trans Am. It's got power like we never saw before. We've got, uh, we've got a 10-speed gearbox on the damn thing, and uh, we're, right now it's, it's like sitting at the drag strip and, and going to town with this thing. As the observation progresses, the teams coordinate to maximize the variety of data they can get. Using the Rossi Explorer's flexibility and response, they change various aspects of the detectors. And as soon as new adjustments are made, new results appear. Look at that! What were those spikes? What are those guys? Look at these things. Those are not statistics. PCA is seeing QPO at 30 hertz. QPO. QPO at 30 hertz. We've got pulsations, bursts, and QPO. This is the gamut of all binary hey, sources. Hey, watch your <laughs> this source is showing all kinds of behaviors that seem like an agglomeration. It's just, just amazing, all the different behavior we're seeing. It's, um, it's like a dream. I never expected that a week or two after we started this show, we'd be sitting here at the controls actually making things happen and getting really good scientific data about something new and exciting. What is this new beacon in the X-ray sky? After a journey of more than 10,000 years, the bursting and pulsing of X-rays has finally made it to our edge of the galaxy. And our craft, the Rossi Explorer, has let us grasp this evidence. It is now that the real magic occurs, for the invisible pulses of X radiation detected by these amazing instruments and recorded with such microscopic precision 
will finally be made tangible. Once again, I know it seems like magic, but it's not. It's science. The same laws of physics that guarantee that I won't hurtle off the planet as I stand up, or that describe the rising of the sun each morning or how the seasons change, are now brought to bear on the data collected by the Rossi Explorer. This is what the scrutiny of science has revealed to us. We know that the source of this X-ray orchestra is towards the very center of our galaxy, over 10,000 light years away in the constellation of Sagittarius. It has been designated GRO J174428, but it is called the Bursting Pulsar. The Bursting Pulsar is all but invisible from the vicinity of Earth, and even much closer, it would appear tiny and dim, giving little clue of its spectacular nature. But X-rays betray that nature. It exhibits a bright X-ray pulse of twice a second. The particular energy and rate of the pulse is a phenomenon which only a spinning neutron star can produce. Applying the principles of Newtonian gravity and Keplerian motion to the data show that this neutron star is in orbit with another star. So the bursting pulsar is actually two stars in what is known as a low-mass X-ray binary system. The two complete an orbit once every 12 days, and the other star is much lighter than our own sun. The data also indicate that the lighter star is getting even lighter, for it must be losing its photosphere to the immense gravity of the neutron star. The laws of gravity indicate that the hot plasma, much like the surface of our own sun, is drawn into the neutron star's gravitational well. Across at least 200 million miles, the stream of plasma falls. A variety of physical principles show that this stream of gas actually forms an accretion disk, which is gravitationally bound to the tiny neutron star at its center. Near the center of the disk, close to the neutron star and deep within the gravitational well it's created, the physics become extreme. The laws which can explain most of our everyday experiences, things like Keplerian motion and Newtonian gravity, can't even begin to apply here. And that's why we look in these strange places, to discover what is beyond the physics we now understand, to test that which has been theorized, but not yet observed. At a point known as the Alphan radius, the broiling tides of particles are captured by the tiny star's magnetic field, which is over a hundred million times greater than Earth's. Great streams of infalling matter are bound to the fields and directed onto the magnetic poles of the neutron star. Accelerated by the profound gravity, it smashes down at about a tenth the speed of light onto a tiny patch which may be only kilometers wide. This concentration of matter creates a searing hotspot which radiates an intense X-ray glow. And this hotspot reveals the neutron star's spin rate, or pulse, as it sweeps across our view. And what about the spectacular bursts which brought this object to our attention? During those bursts, this tiny object would emit more X-rays than all other X-ray sources in the sky combined. How could this tiny object produce so much energy? It is thought that a huge amount of matter piles up somewhere at the inner edge of the accretion disk, and all at once, in one relativistic plunge only seconds long, this immense blob finally crashes onto the poles. When mass is accelerated to these great velocities, then decelerated in an instant, the result is a great release of energy, a blinding burst of X radiation that for a few brief moments is brighter than all the X rays in the sky combined. By far, this is not all that data from the Rossi Explorer has allowed us to understand. We have gained a compelling confirmation of Einstein's general theory by peering closer than ever before at neutron stars and black holes spinning thousands of times every second. This world has long been postulated by Einstein's theories, but has never been observed until now. The Rossi Explorer has for the first time given science the ability to see something called millisecond QPO. These rapid variations in X-rays, on the order of mere thousandths of a second, are the result of phenomena in this world of profound gravity, a place where science can now test the untried frontiers of physics. 
In another observation, the Rossi Explorer has shown us a black hole which ejects its accretion disk every half an hour, throwing off huge jets of material at nearly the speed of light, perhaps giving us insight into the enigmatic behavior of quasars, which are thought to be the most energetic objects in the cosmos. It is becoming less and less a matter of theory about phenomena as extreme as these. For the Rossi Explorer is enabling us to confirm that these incredible worlds are, after all, as real as you and I. 10,000 years ago, our reality was no less true than now. We still struggle to understand, but in different ways. Back then, we didn't know what a cloud was, or what, if anything, was over that horizon. But we wondered. Driven by that uniquely human capacity, one of our craft, the Rossi Explorer, has taken us out over that horizon. Space exploration especially has been, has shown that, that whenever you do look somewhere where you haven't looked before, you do find interesting things. There's a whole array of new phenomena that were unknown, completely unknown before, which have already been discovered. We launched the uh, XTE just in time to catch those bursts that started out some 30,000 years ago. And, uh, that's always kind of interesting to think about. But that mission is up there and trucking from target to target to target. This mission is going to be a success and that a lot of things we've dreamed of over all these years are really going to come true. From this object to that object, the next object, and those, those data are getting shipped out to all these scientists. You know, that's the success of XTE. The X-ray Timing Explorer is new in that it gives you the chance to do this real-time look at what you're seeing, and, and that's, that's very exciting. It's, it's like you're, you yourself are really making the measurement, not this distant satellite. It's, it's opening up you know, our investigation into a whole new domain uh, where we fully expect there's all kinds of things going on, but we, we've never had a chance to look there before. We have met the bursting pulsar and have dug into its mysteries. We push back the frontiers of physics. Our wonder, no less fervent than long ago, now stands at the edge of a new shoreline. All we're left to do now is dare to dream what fantastic and real places we can go.